Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Ragbeer Kakar, and thank you for attending the latest version of our OS um, uh, webinar. Um, as you know, we have um, these sessions uh, twice a month, and it's a real pleasure and honour for me to introduce my two good friends and colleagues, Mr. Neem Hadari and Mr. Thomas Hester. Uh, my name is Ragbeer Kakar. I'm your host for this evening, and we're going to be talking today about ankle arthritis, what are the options for treatment, and when to refer ankle pain. Orthopaedic specialist is made up of um, multiple uh, surgeons, physicians, um, maxillofacial surgeons, covering the entirety of the um, MSK um, pathology that you may wish to get assistance for, uh, ranging from upper limb, lower limb, spine, um, and, and as you'll see from today, foot and ankle. Um, we're really lucky to have um, two, two superstars from around um, London and abroad. Um, who are handpicked and chosen to be part of the group because they bring a special um, expertise and they're highly regarded in their individual fields. So you'll see from a lot of these faces, these are people you may have seen previously on the webinars, and today we're lucky to have Tom and Nima presenting. The Harley Street Specialist Hospital is our day case unit and the centre where we do our outpatient consulting. It's a beautiful um, triple-fronted building on Queen Anne Street, and it's recently been refurbished by the team to have brand new theatres, of which one of them's online now. And um, we're about to have a second theatre opening up towards the end of the year. And we've even opened up a dental suite on the first floor uh, for our maxillofacial surgeons. Um, so this is where if we are going to see our patients, we typically see them here um, and do our day, day case procedures in this building. We're also very lucky to be associated with the London Clinic. As you know, the London Clinic is one of the largest private hospitals in London. And uh, this is where we do our major uh, procedures where patients need overnight stay and they, they um, help support um, these webinars. So many thanks to them. And if you're associated with them, many thanks for uh, coming along. Um, we, we hope to see you at the London Clinic. And then finally, the Cromwell Hospital uh, this is a fantastic institution in West London, where we've recently become partners with um, and doing um, work and consulting in, in, the, in the rooms there. So if you are based in the West London area, we can see patients at the Cromwell Hospital also. So Mr. Nima Hadari, it doesn't really require an introduction. He's, he's a very well-known and highly respected surgeon working out of Europe's largest trauma centre at the Royal London. Um, he is the uh, Limb Recon uh, lead at that centre. Um, and he's uh, um, been involved with the advancement of trauma management, particularly with the um, orthopaedic surgical body known as AO, who have various arms. And he's currently the chair for the UK uh, arm of the foot and ankle section for that. So he's, he's well known for all the work that he, he does. He's vastly published in, in trauma management and is a global opinion on the management of bone infection. The topics that um, Mr. Hadari is gonna uh, cover today will include recognizing ankle arthritis, the clinical presentation, how to make an assessment um, um, uh, to identify what's going on and what the pathology is. Does imaging have a role to play and what imaging is required? And then gonna finish off by talking about different treatment options. Mr. Tom Hester is a good friend of mine. Um, I'm currently working out of King's College London, which is also a major trauma center. And he's got a tertiary referral practice there. He specializes in all aspects of foot and ankle um, conditions. And he's, he's had a fantastic uh, training at internationally renowned centers out of Toronto and Calgary. His interest is in minimally invasive surgery, including arthroscopic techniques. And he covers the full range of uh, forefoot, midfoot and hindfoot pathologies. So Tom's gonna to look at when to refer ankle pain, what are the red flags to look out for, when is an ankle sprain not an ankle sprain, and when it's a good time to refer on. Um, my name is Ragbeer Kaka, I, I work with the, with the team and I'm a knee surgeon, um, uh, part of orthopedic specialists. My main um, interest is in limb deformity and sports, uh, sports knee, as well as knee arthritis. And I'm really lucky to be part of the team with Tom and Nima. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass over to Tom and Nima in just a moment, but so you know where the next talks are gonna be on the 24th of March, and it'll be myself and Professor Wilson covering contemporary techniques on the management of knee pain. 
So it's quite a broad topic talking about all aspects of knee pain and hopefully we'll be able to enlighten you on the sort of latest developments in this area. As per all of our webinars, there are two CPD points to follow once, you, once you've completed your questionnaires uh, and you'll, you'll get those um, within the next 24 to 48 hours. We're quite hot on social media, so please do follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and we're also on Instagram. So if you look up orthopedic specialists, you'll find us there. Um, and you'll also find Nima and Tom on LinkedIn. And, um, and there are these are our Twitter handles. For your inquiries, if you have general inquiries for any aspects of orthopedics, um, do use our general inquiries telephone number. Uh, but if you have a very specific, if you have a specific inquiry after Tom and Nima's talks today, um, please find the number attached um, for for specific foot and ankle questions. Um, you can use the email address and visit us on our website. And we have a YouTube channel where we upload our latest videos, uh, which may be related to patient uh, patients or procedures that we're doing. I really hope you enjoy this evening. I'm going to hand over to Nima. Brilliant, Rex, thank you very much. Um, Tom, I think uh, you, you'll go first talking about um, general problems of the foot and ankle and when to refer. Over to you, Tom, thank you. Great, uh, thanks Rex for the intro. So yeah, my name is Tom Hester. I'm a consultant foot and ankle surgeon at one of the less, one of the smaller trauma centers then uh, apparently in Europe uh, at King's College Hospital. Um, where I have a subspecialty, uh, well, my interest in complex trauma, and then I have a super sort of subspecialty interest in um, Charcot arthropathy or, um, or diabetic arthropathy, neuropathic feet. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is when to refer. And the answer is, despite what some of my colleagues were saying, isn't all the time, because it's a, this is obviously a, a, a sort of a private practice type talk. Uh, what I hope to do is give you um, a few pointers about when's a good time to, to, um, to refer on. Sorry, I've got no uh, relevant disclosures. Uh, what I don't want to do is teach you to suck eggs. Um, you know, everyone has their own threshold to refer when the patients are ready. Um, but what I want to try and do is give you a bit of a structure and try and avoid these things, okay, which is medical legal uh, issues. Litigation, unfortunately, is just part of uh, healthcare. healthcare. Um, it is, uh, it, it is just, it's just part and parcel of the job, right? Um, and this is a great uh, review article um, from uh, Bone and Joint 360, one of the orthopedic journals, um, which looked at sort of medical legal issues in the foot and ankle specialty. And one of the sort of take home points uh, was here, which is, is just the importance of reaching a correct and timely diagnosis um, and just being cognizant of your management plan, um, which are sort of important points to uh, prevent litigation. So another uh, article around a sort of similar theme. And what I wanted to highlight from that is the uh, sort of the cost of these missed injuries, the sort of mean litigation costs. Uh, a typical missed tendon injury sort of, sort of settles for around 57,000. So it's quite, you know, these are quite expensive, uh, expensive mistakes to make. What I don't want to do, though, is every time you hear hooves, you, you think zebras. Um, common things are still common. Heel pain is almost certainly going to be plantar fasciitis or insertion of Achilles tendinopathy. Um, but what I'm hoping to do is like I say, give you a structure. And I think the reason why a lot of these uh, sort of problems with a diagnosis or delay diagnosis occur is because the, the foot and ankle is a complex structure, right? There's uh, multiple you know, nerves, blood vessels, tendons, bony structures that are all intimately relinked. You've got your midfoot problems, um, your talus, navicular, uh, on the lateral side, the perineals, which are so close to those lateral ligaments and they, you know, can all masquerade as similar things. And so getting your diagnosis spot on can sometimes, um, you know, can sometimes throw people. So as I said, what I want to do is give you a structure on how to think about these things, look out for some of the red flags and how to avoid sort of common pitfalls. So typically I like to think about it as atraumatic versus traumatic mechanisms, rule out those red flags. And then also when is the, When's it time to call it enough's enough and the conservative measures have failed? 
So starting off with the atraumatic, I, I mean, no sort of talk about atraumatic pain would be complete without malignancy. This is rare, okay? So what I've tried to do as I go through is give a sort of typical scenario and then some of the stats about it. Uh, typically over 60s, gradual onsets of, of pain over months, you know, sort of, sort of you know, taking a little bit of time to present. What is a, can be a bit more sort of sinister is sort of more recent swelling. But remember, these things are very rare. Chondrosarcs are rare. They're only 25% of all MSK tumors. And uh, foot and ankle chondrosarcomas represent only 5% of those. Okay, so this is, is very small. This is a good review article uh, down at the bottom there as well. But you can see this is a plain film just looking side on and it shows this lesion here. But even you know, the x-rays they've been measuring, looking at what a cavus foot he's got rather than actually you know, that, that, as that as a source of heel pain, rather than this is the source of the heel pain. This is a chondrosarc. And the red flags to look out for are night pain, swelling, which I say can be a bit of a late uh, sort of sign and late skin changes. I think the main point to take away from that is that if, uh, if you're still unclear of a diagnosis, just try and think outside the box. As I mentioned, I do have a specialist interest in, in Charcot arthropathy. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's definitely worth a mention. Typically patients are mid forties, you know, fifties, high BMI. They come in sort of no real history of trauma, but vague swelling of the foot, but it's unilateral. Okay. And that's a, I think that's a, a big clue. And it's important to mention that your chances or the risk of, of developing a Charcot arthropathy if you're diabetic is, is up to 29% if you're neuropathic and up to 13% if you're just diabetic. So it's, I think it's really worth keeping that in mind. A lot of the time, and I think a big misconception is that when people think of Charcot, they think of this top X-ray. So this big deformity, a massive swollen deformed foot, how could you possibly miss it? But they don't start like this. They all start like this bottom X-ray. So completely normal. They've got this, you know, they've got some pain, a little bit of, well, not even pain some of the time, just some swelling. And they present because they've got some swelling in their foot to have a normal x-ray. But remember, if they're diabetic, have a really high, a really low threshold or a really high suspicion that there's something else going on, particularly if they're poorly controlled diabetics, a high HbA1c, they've got a loss of protective sense. It'd be ideal if you could do a monofilament, but you know, if you're going to ask, that'd be fantastic or look from a recent diabetic clinic letter. And if there's a temperature difference, our threshold in clinic is two degrees. But in a community, if you feel there's a temperature difference between the two feet and they're diabetic, it's got to be Charcot until proven otherwise. But when's enough to actually think about referring on with these atraumatic pains? You know, you've, you've We've, we've got the orthotics in place, we're working hard with, a, with the physios, maybe even considered some steroids or biologic injections, but when's the time to maybe refer on and think about, uh, think about surgical uh, intervention? Starting with ankle pain, Neem is gonna talk about this in a lot more detail, so I'll just briefly touch on it. Um, I mean, this is an end-stage ankle arthritis X-ray, and you know, if the patients aren't making progress, that would be a, you know, a sort of clear cut that probably needs uh, some surgical intervention. But a lot of the time, it's subjective. You know, if the patients aren't keen on surgery, or there's no, um, they're, they're functioning fine, then obviously there's no need to re refer on. But what I want to sort of stress, and I know Neem's going into this, is that it doesn't need to be end stage before you consider, um, ref consider referring on or consider is there any other options other than orthotics and physio. You know, ankle arthroscopy is always a, a good option in certain instances, ligament rebalancing. There's plenty of other things that can be done or in combination with, with physiotherapy, biologics and orthotics. Heel pain. I think with this, always worth just reconsidering your diagnosis. It's very easy to be labeled plantar fasciitis, plantar fasciitis, or insertional Achilles tendinopathy, and you just keep working on that premise the whole time because that's what's, what the referral letter says or that's what the patient's told you. But just rethink your, or, or just be cognizant it could be something else. So consider your differential, particularly if they're not progressing or something just doesn't quite seem right, or if things are just getting worse. This is a heel squeeze test for um, a calcaneal stress fracture. Um, 
you know, which is obviously has a slightly different management plan. And if you if you've got some plain imaging and it shows a particularly a big spur around the insertion of the Achilles tendon, there's good surgical options to deal with this. And the same for uh, recalcitrant uh, plantar fasciitis as well. Um, so always worth uh, just thinking if they've exhausted conservative measures, there are other surgical options. And again, no uh, sort of atraumatic um, ankle pain lecture would be complete without thinking not just about the ankle and the, and the, the, uh, the tendon and the bones down there, but thinking about the whole patient, which uh, I'm often find myself guilty of. I get so focused on my subspecialty, I sort of forget about the, the, the sort of global picture. Um, this is a mnemonic by Paul Kerwin, who's a, a physiotherapist, and it was originally designed for knees, but it's, it's an excellent screening tool just to make sure there's no uh, underlying uh, um, inflammatory arthropathy or spondyloarthropathy. And I think it's, it's really worth just going through, uh, keeping mindful of those and going through a few things. So looking at the traumatic side of um, ankle pain, when's a sprain not a sprain? Okay, I mean, that's, that's the most common thing we all see. And most of the time you think, well, that Ottawa anchor rules have, have got my back, right? Like we've, I've been through the, 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 the simple steps. It's been around for 25 years or so now. And uh, Ian Stahl, who came up with it, um, had some fantastic results. I mean, in his initial paper, only 2% of patients um, who were shown not to need radiographs actually had a fracture. So it's, it's, it's perfect, right? Well, it is, it is a very good tool, but what I would say is that some people just go to this part of, the, of his algorithm, which is you know, pain within this sort of six centimeter zone, pain on the back of the fibula, pain in the styloid, pain over the navicular. But it also has a lot of caveats as well. And I think he really does lay uh, sort of importance on the history and, that, and also other exclusion factors or distracting factors as well. And I think it's really important that we bear those things in mind. So starting off with midfoot injuries, which are back to that initial, there's an initial couple of slides on litigation. These are a big, they've missed a lot of the time and can be a big cause of litigation. Typical patient can be any age, commonly young and sporty, but they, they have a, they're not so clear on the mechanism. Okay, so it can be just a rolled ankle um, and they can present just with some swelling over the ankle, uh, but it's missed up to 20% of the time. And the red flags to look for, if they've got swelling, so they will have swelling around the ankle as well, but swelling over the dorsum of the foot. And then when you look underneath the foot, they have this plantar ecchymosis, this plantar bruising. And this is a midfoot injury until proven otherwise. It's not just bruising, tracking down the ankle joint. It need, that, that needs investigation and exclusion of a midfoot injury. Tibant rupture, relatively uncommon, but it presents in such an atypical way that often people don't think about it. Typically a 50 or 65, 50 to 65 year old patient, often male, they stumble, they don't really think much of it. They get a bit of anterior ankle pain and they can still walk afterwards. And even more sort of strange to the patient is that they think, well, actually I can still lift my foot up and still ankle, actively ankle dorsiflex. So it can't be anything, right? Well, when you look at them, they've got this, uh, they, they lose their anterior contour. You see here on the left, they've got a nice tip out there. Here on the right, there's no tip out. It's, you can see that loss of the contour. Sometimes I'm anterior bruising if you, if you pick them up early enough, but again, often just missed or sort of misdiagnosed as, a, as an ankle sprain. And they can still bring their foot up. They can still anterior dorsiflex. So you can see them recruiting their long extensors here to bring their, their foot up. And then probably one of the more commonly missed injuries, missing 15 to 20% of patients who sustain this is perineal subluxation. So tearing of this, um, this retinaculum on the outside of the ankle. So this is your fibula perineals that come down the side here and they tear this little sleeve of tissue there. And it presents exactly like a sprain. It's the same mechanism, roll their ankle, able to weight bear afterwards, treated like an ankle sprain. They may not even come to see you that early on. Uh, but they then can, they've got this impressive clicking. They can um, make it pop over their, their fibula, show you here. And if you 
when you see them, if you can see them acutely, the features look ex again exactly like an ankle sprain. So they have bruising over the ankle. It tends to be when on a bit, when you look really closely, they have a lot of bruising around the back of the ankle there. Uh, and when you get them to push against, uh, push a little toe again, uh, outwards, so four for abduction or some uh, external rotation, you can get the perineals to sublux over the fibula here. And the reason it's important to pick that up early is if you, do, if you leave it for a long time, the perineals themselves can get torn. And then the treatment for that has a much longer recovery. Perineal uh, tendon tears take a really long time to settle down post-op. Tendo Achilles ruptures. I mean, you think you, you mentioned this in like ED teaching and things, and everyone thinks, how can you miss a ruptured tendo Achilles? Like it's impossible, surely. But actually, in this uh, review article, there it was missed in up to thirty-six percent of patients in the over sixty-fives. Again, a lot of the time because they're relatively low demand, they don't want to bother people. Um, they again just are pretty innocuous. They trip. They're able to wait there afterwards. They, they can't stand on tiptoes for sure, but they can bend their foot down. They can plant a flex because they can use their long flexes, their toe flexes. But when you see them, they have a, you know, this, so this is a Simmons test. So both uh, calves have been squeezed at the same time. And you can see this ankle here passively plantar flexes and this one doesn't. And there's some swelling over the back of the ankle there. And then on palpation, you can see that there's a, a divot here in the, um, uh, in the Achilles, where there's loss of continuity. And what about those ankle sprains that are just failing to improve, right? So, I mean, when should they be improving? I think that's a big question. And this is a, a good re a review article that shows they should be going in the right direction by six weeks. That's not saying they'll be better by six weeks, because I think we all know that that doesn't happen. What it means is they should be going, they should be having some improvement. They shouldn't still be in a lot of pain, a lot of swelling, things that make you think, well, they just, it, it, something must be up here. And in fact, the same paper shows that pa patients can have ongoing instability for over a year. And I think, or some or ongoing uh, difficulties up to a year. And I think that's probably more likely, but the, the main thing is that first six weeks, they should improve. And if they don't, you have to think, well, is their pain changing a little bit? Is it not quite now all just over the lateral aspect of the ankle? Has it started to go more into the center of the ankle, or more into the medial side of the ankle? This is a plain x-ray looking from the front. The fibula is there and you can see on here, they've got an OCD. So uh, where the talus is, is banged into that medial shoulder, uh, they've knocked a bit off their talus. And this is present in up to 4% of ankle sprain. So again, it's really worth paying attention to the pain. Is it purely just over the outside or is it on, the, on that inside shoulder? And what about those ones that have even had normal x-rays? Okay, this is a set of x-rays being reported as normal, looks pretty normal, even looks pretty normal to me. But there's some key points in this x-ray which I'll come to. When you see the patient at a few weeks down the line, they're still complaining, they've got pain on the medial side. Probably not too relevant in the grand scheme of things, but it could be just a deltoid injury. But they've got pain now. It's not just over the side, over the ATFL, CFL. It's more just around the ankle joint anteriorly. And on further palpation, they've got pain up at the top of their, of their uh, sort of their, their fibula, so their fibula head. Get some whole leg x-rays or whole tibial x-rays now. And you can see here on the lateral, they've got a high fibula fracture. So this is a mason nerve type injury uh, and they've got a syndesmotic injury. So how did they have possible normal x-rays? It's because they weren't weight bearing and they didn't include the whole fibula. And these are misdiagnosed. I think this is a little high. This is from this meta systematic review and meta-analysis. And they said up to 18% of um, syndesmotic injuries are, are misdiagnosed. That seems a little high to me, but um, that's what this big review review showed. So it's, basically, don't be so reassured. Be reassured by be guided by the patient details, not by the um, by the the, re the reports of the X-rays. Because also, the X-rays are only as good as the X-rays you request, right? Lateral Taylor process fractures, probably not so important this year with uh, lockdown and the travel restrictions, but um, you certainly see a few of these normally. Um, typical scenario, young snowboarders come back from 
uh, from being abroad, often seen in his local country, he comes with those printed out plane films that we don't, you know, you don't see that often. Uh, he's been diagnosed as an ankle sprain by the on uh, sort of on mountain um, minor injuries unit. Uh, he's been said, told he needs to come to see his primary care physician or or get a referral for physiotherapy. And these are missed in up to 41% of initial presentations. Okay, so it's almost a 50-50 whether these get picked up. And you can see why. This is a plain X-ray of, uh, of the ankle looking from the front again. And here's the, here's the lateral Taylor process fracture. Okay, so they are pretty hard to see and a high index of suspicion. So the red flags you should be looking for really is the mechanism, a snowboarder. The pain, it can be very similar to a uh, lateral ligament injury. Uh, and so palpation around that, um, uh, around that sort of anterior, uh, anterior lateral aspect of the ankle may not be that helpful. But I think being mindful, again, of the history, coming back to the uh, Ottawa ankle rules. So just to recap the, the, the red flags, okay, night pain, is obviously a big red flag for any sort of uh, health, health practitioner. Diabetes, again, I'm probably slightly biased just because of my practice is skewed by it, but you really need to have a low threshold and really rethink really what is the underlying problem. Plantar bruising, it's a midfoot fracture until proven otherwise. Always be cognizant of the high ankle sprain, okay? Particularly if you think they're just not recovering from this, you know, from this ankle injury as fast as you would normally expect. And just check whether the radiographs were weight bearing and included the whole ankle. Loss of ankle contour, both front and back. Is it a tib ant rupture or is it an Achilles tendon rupture? And failure to improve. Just come and rethink your diagnosis. There's no harm in that. Um, you, just because someone's labeled it a, a, a mild ankle sprain doesn't mean it necessarily is, even if it's a uh, even if it's a specialist in that area, it's always nice to get a fresh set of eyes on something and uh, and just rethink what it definitely what it definitely is. So the take home messages: look for the red flags, rule those out. That should hopefully keep you out of bother uh, and, and and not being a, a statistic in one of those papers. Always examine the foot. Midfoot injuries, Charco. By examining the foot you will uh, hopefully reassure yourself that you're not missing a good injury. And if it's not settling, as I said, rethink, have a look at some further imaging or refer on. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Great, Tom, thank you very much. Uh, that's a very nice overview of uh, some of the issues that we really all have to worry about and think about uh, to make sure we get them correctly diagnosed. So, what I might do now is, uh, Tom, if you finish sharing, what I might do is I'll start my uh, talk. Can you see my screen there? Yep. Yep. I see it good. Great. So thank you everyone for attending. I'm going to talk about um, ankle arthritis, a little bit about how we assess patients for ankle arthritis, um, a variety of um, surgical techniques that we can employ uh, to treat ankle arthritis. And I'll touch on some of the other more uh, modern solutions uh, for ankle arthritis, but um, relatively briefly, this is much more centered around some of the surgical options that are available and, and sort of giving you a critique of those. So my name is Nima Heitari. I have a particular interest in the reconstruction of the lower limb uh, and particularly of the foot and ankle. These are my disclosures that uh, I am part of an orthopedic specialist. Uh, I work out of the Harley Street Specialist Hospital, the London Clinic and the BMI London Independent in Stepney Green. Uh, Tom and I are the foot and ankle service for orthopedic specialists uh, and these are some of our uh, contact details as you can see uh, the pandemic has uh, obliged me to shave my beard for mask fitting but in normal times I do support a beard on my face. I'm going to give you an overview of what we're going to do. I'm going to talk a little bit about the etiology, the reasons uh, people develop ankle arthritis um, some of the things that I think about and I concentrate on when I'm um, assessing patients and then run through some of the solutions that we have for it. Ankle joint is, a, is an interesting one. 
only about one to four percent of arthritis which is uh, diagnosed is associated with the ankle joint. If you look at um, hip and knee arthritis, which are the vast majority of arthritis, they um, usually are described as having idiopathic etiology. And what that means is that they're of unknown origin. There are environmental and genetic factors that come together to cause patients to have arthritis of the hip and knee. In the ankle joint though, the vast majority are as a result of trauma. And this is the, an interesting and important point, particularly some of the things that Tom was talking about, that we don't know if by treating these patients early and treating their injuries correctly, we can reduce the risk of, risk of ankle arthritis. There is no evidence for it, but it seems a reasonable thing to get to these early and prevent this problem before it happens. Other reasons for developing uh, ankle arthritis are rheumatoid arthritis. These are inflammatory arthritis that uh, have uh, a systemic effect. Multiple joints are affected, but only a small proportion of them are idiopathic or of unknown cause. There are a number of other reasons such as gout and infection, um, blood problems, and also disruption of the blood supply to the bones of the ankle that can cause arthritis. When I come to um, examine a patient, discuss the story of the, of the patient's pain with them, um, I think about whether it's an inflammatory pain or a mechanical pain. Inflammatory pain is pain after periods of inactivity, pain first thing in the morning, uh, pain after sitting down for a long period of time. And mechanical pain is pain on bearing load. And with foot and ankle, you have to really this, get the patient to describe in what circumstances they get pain. Do they get pain in the front of the ankle when they are um, walking on an, on an incline? Um, do they get pain on the instep of the ankle? Uh, do they find it difficult to go on tiptoes? All of these can indicate the anatomy of the problem being in different places. History of previous injuries is important. Comorbidities and exercise tolerance are two things that I think about as a surgeon because these are important things to consider when you are thinking about surgery. Patients who have multiple comorbidities, um, difficulties with their heart and with their lungs obviously pose a greater risk and that needs to be identified early on so that you can um, guide the patient towards the right treatment. Examining a patient, uh, habitus is important. One of the issues with arthritis in the foot and ankle is that there is a direct correlation between the severity of symptoms and the patient's weight. Patients who demand more of these small joints do end up having more pain. Sometimes if there is early degenerative changes in the ankle joint, by losing some weight, all of the symptoms can be mitigated. But I'm not saying that that is an easy thing, but it is a, a thing that needs to be discussed with the patient so that they're aware of it. Ankle is also very sensitive to deformity. So following injuries and fractures, if the ankle is deformed, the symptoms can be mitigated by correction of that deformity. There are other issues such as the instability of the ankle. Soft tissues are very important because the soft tissue around the ankle is, um, uh, is a difficult one to reconstruct and it's important to examine it before we think about um, uh, reconstructive surgery. And the neurovascular examination is part and parcel of that, particularly the sensation to identify whether it's poor sensation in the foot and ankle that is causing problems. Imaging is, um, is integral to examination of the ankle. X-rays, uh, again, exactly as Tom said earlier on, they have to be weight-bearing. The ankle is a load-bearing joint, and it's very important to have weight-bearing X-rays. If there is any um, issue with regards to deformity, is there any deformity present? The long leg alignment film allows us to assess the alignment of the limb from the hips all the way down to the ankle. CT scan is, um, is very good at uh, defining the bony anatomy and the MRI scan is good at looking for 
uh, defects in the cartilage, the soft tissues, the presence of marrow edema within various uh, bones of the foot and ankle. And we really have to identify where is the problem? Is it the problem over the front of the ankle? Has the patient got anterior impingement? Is it because of instability? Is there deformity? Or is this part of a systemic condition? And all of these will feed together for us to be able to think about a solution. All of the solutions in orthopedic surgery, they fall into two general categories. You either operate or you don't operate. So conservative treatments and the surgical treatment. And in the surgical treatment, um, I think about joint preserving and joint sacrificing uh, techniques. With conservative treatment, there are a number of things that need to happen. Adjustment of activities. So impact exercises, maybe do less of those, more things like swimming and cycling rather than running and jogging. Orthotics, altering the shoes, using anti-inflammatory medication to try and reduce the pain. And then there is a whole group of injections that um, can be uh, used and steroids being one of them. Steroids, are, they really are falling out of favor. Less and less of um, these injections are, are being used. There are uh, they are very good at reducing uh, symptoms um, in the short term, but they may be detrimental in the longer term. There is some evidence that hyaluronic acid uh, can provide some pain relief. There are a number of papers out now that show that platelet rich plasma and bone marrow aspirate concentrates are also good. And there are a number of other uh, solutions that are becoming available, such as microfragmented fat, stromal banks, vascular fraction. There are case series that are demonstrating that there are a group of individuals that this is useful for, but it is not useful for everyone. With regards to the operative management, ankle arthrodesis or fusion is one of these. And this is by taking the joint out and reducing, in essentially removing the movement from the ankle joint, thereby removing the pain. I will have got some cases where I demonstrate exactly what this means, but there are consequences to this. As with any surgical intervention, there are uh, possible complications and they include non-union. That means the, uh, the bones that you wish to heal together don't heal. That goes between one to 17%, depending on um, what, um, paper you read, post-operative complications, which include uh, clots in the calf, infection, uh, and a number of other things are between three to 25%. That is basically um, mostly dependent on the surgical technique used and also the comorbidities of the patient. And by taking all of the movement out of the ankle joint, there is a consequence of the other joints in the foot and ankle having to work harder Thereby, thereby becoming arthritic sooner. So the rates of subtalar and talonavicular joint arthritis, again, are very depending on where you get your information, but we know that this, is, this happens. And the younger the patient where they have a fusion, the more likely it is that they develop these consequences in their lifetime. What it does do though, is that it significantly improves pain, it reduces disability and it improves function. What we find is that only 78% of people return to wearing normal shoes. The rest actually do require um, some form of alteration uh, in the footwear. Here is a, a typical case. This is a 64 year old lady. She broke her ankle a few years ago and it's never really been quite the same. She used to enjoy walking, but unfortunately now she just can't do it. And here we are. You can see that this uh, is the ankle x-ray of this lady. You can see the evidence of a previous fracture fixation. You can see that the ankle is tipped into valgus so that this is the outer side of the ankle. This is the inner side and you can see that the ankle is really tilted and the, this deformity is because of the loss of bone over the, in the distal tibia, which is a consequence of um, these kind of injuries. The treatment for this is an ankle fusion. You can see she's had the um, tibia and the talus
fused together with plates and screws and this provides dramatic pain relief for her. She's now able to go walking and she can do that wearing her walking, sturdy walking boots. Another case is of a lady who is 81. She's had progressive ankle pain and instability over the past seven or eight years. She's now reached a stage where the ankle pain is really debilitating. She can't bear, load, bear any load on it, very mechanical in nature. And it, she tells me that the foot feels like it's not really connected to the rest of her leg. And here, that her ankle is in varus. It has gone completely the other way. There is a huge amount of loss of um, the, the joint space. And you can see that this, this time the heel is actually on the inner side of the tibia. Again, the solution for her is uh, an ankle fusion. This one I did minimally invasively, arthroscopically, and by putting a rod to really support the tibia all the way up. By putting big metal work um, around the tibia, she's liable to get fractures around these uh, implants. Therefore, for this lady, I elected to support the uh, entire tibia with this. And again, she complains about her ankle being stiff, but now she's able to walk uh, and she's able to at least do her own shopping again. The next thing is an ankle replacement. We replace the hip joint and the knee joint regularly. Uh, these are uh, life-changing interventions. Certainly for the hip replacement, it is one of the uh, few medical interventions that is genuinely uh, life-changing and it's a very, very good option. For knee replacements also, up to 80% of individuals do have a very good result from it. For the ankle, however, it is a bit of a different story. We still haven't found the answer as we have done for the hip and the knee. The survival is anywhere between 71 to 90% at eight to 10 years. And that is survival to revision. A lot of the patients who have had ankle replacements up to now are very elderly and they have very low demand. So many of them don't actually survive necessarily up to 10 years, but the survival of the ankle prosthesis seems to be relatively varied. There is a high failure rate, which can be quite substantial. And in a younger patient, this is actually quite devastating. One of the other issues with ankle replacement is that surgery is occasionally required for uh, reasons other than um, revision of the ankle replacement itself. And a, a, a statistic that um, was certainly true a few years ago was that um, one, in, one in eight individuals require repeat surgery in, within a year of having their ankle replaced. Um, I looked at the National Joint Registry a little while ago, I need to update this, but one of the things certainly is that only about 3,000 ankle replacements were on our National Joint Registry at that time. Of these, uh, 105 have been revised for a variety of reasons, and that's a 3% rate at the five years that the joint registry was running at that time. The consequences are formation of extra bone around the ankle replacement, which then results in the mobility of the ankle joint, essentially being much the same as an ankle fusion. Up to 20% of adjacent joints also become arthritic after an ankle replacement, up to 20%. So it doesn't protect the adjacent joint quite as much as we, we had hoped that it would. And the up to 3% of these joints require some sort of intervention for arthrodesis. When you compare uh, ankle replacement with ankle fusion, they do have similar functional scores and functional outcomes. There is a certainly a higher failure rate with a total ankle replacement, that's what the TAR means. And they have relatively similar rates of adjacent joint arthritis. So it's, I think it, it then needs to be um, appropriately, individuals need to be appropriately uh, cautioned about it. They need to be told all of the ins and outs of it. And for some individuals who are lower demand, 
it may well be an excellent uh, possibility for, to relieve their ankle arthritis pain. The next thing that I want to talk about is preservation of the ankle joint. And for me, this uh, falls into a number of um, categories. One of them is correction of the alignment. I think we need to restore the alignment of the ankle. And I have got some cases which I will show you. Something called distraction arthrolysis, which is essentially pulling the joint apart for a period of time to allow the cartilage in the joint to re recover. And a number of adjuncts. And in these adjuncts, I think about using biologics such as platelet rich plasma, bone marrow aspirate, microfragmented fat, as well as some mechanical uh, adjuncts such as uh, ligament reconstruction and ligament rebalancing that Tom was talking about earlier on. Here, 29 year old lady, she fell climbing five years ago, incredibly active and wants to, wants to do more than she's able to. She describes her ankle as being tight and painful. So here are her x-rays. You can see that uh, I've got comparison x-rays uh, with the contralateral side. The arthritic ankle is on the left side, which is actually on the right side of your screen. The first thing to do is to look at the alignment of the joint. And you can see that the alignment of the joint of the arthritic ankle is not normal. This should be a right angle here. The, the, the ankle joint thereby being level to the ground when you walk. This is not the case here. Looking at the lateral view, you can see that she has got these huge osteophytes uh, at the front. So I discussed in detail with her some of the things that we could do. And one of the things that I wanted to do for her was to correct the alignment of the limb at the same time removing those spurs and also performing distraction. So here we are. This is um, actually performed with a circular device, so an external fixator. You can see that I have performed an osteotomy, so I have divided the bone, both the tibia and the fibula, which I then gradually correct in time. You can see here it is. This is the sideways view, the lateral view of the ankle. Um, and here is the foot also included in the frame. You can see the osteophytes at the front of the ankle have been removed. And if you look at the ankle joint just next to this blue circle, you can see that I have now distracted it. After a period of time, this is, this is the ankle joint uh, just uh, after the X-fix has been put on. And here it is with the deformity corrected and the ankle distracted. The ankle is hinged, the distractor is hinged, so we can continue with the range of movement exercises of the ankle. She's now some uh, two and a half years down the line. She's happy that she's had it done, but uh, the ankle is never quite the same. I have 20 patients that I have done this sort of procedure for, and about seven of them have required other operations, including ankle um, fusion, and one of them has had an ankle replacement uh, following this. But the other 13 continue to have good function and they're happy that they've had it done. Here is a case of um, the ankle distraction in a 55 year old male who's got idiopathic ankle arthritis. You can see that here. Now the cartilage, this is what it looks like inside. You can see, uh, I mean, I suppose uh, it's, it's difficult to know, but this is the talus here. And you can see that the cartilage within the talus, uh, so over the top of the talus, is very frayed uh, and not very much of it there. And, and you, can, you can get an idea that a lot of it is worn away here. Here is the ankle um, external fixator. You can see that there is a ring around the foot, there is a ring around the tibia, and the threaded rods on the side allow us to um, pull to distract the ankle. And they can actually, you can see that uh, the device is articulated so that the ankle can be moved so that they can uh, continue with range of movement exercises whilst the ankle is being distracted. This um, stays on for, um, for about 12 weeks, after which it comes off, but the rehabilitation does take another four or five months after this. 
Here is um, another lady with um, ankle arthritis. She had multiple sprains throughout her um, teens. A very, very athletic young lady, played a lot of netball. Um, and here you can see the MRI scan. Um, and again, complete effacement of the joint. This is at the front of the joint. You can see that she's got the similar osteophytes at the front, which impinge. She also had the osteophytes removed, distraction of the ankle joint. This is um, approximately uh, six months or so after having the um, frame removed. And this is her actually three years down the line. You can see that she's grown the osteophytes at the front of the ankle, but she still has a uh, joint line. She is, again, the typical thing is that the ankle is, of course, never the same, but she's very happy she's had it done. There is reducing the range of movement, and actually she finds that she can do much more than she did before the procedure. And this is a lady who has bought herself another uh, two or three years of good ankle function uh, before she needs to have any definitive uh, non-joint sparing surgery done. Another issue with the ankle is one of deformity and instability. Here is a young lady who had a, an open tibial fracture. So she was hit by a van, a terrible injury to her tibia. Uh, this has been fixed. It has gone on to heal, thankfully. You can see the soft tissue shadow on this lady's leg and how the soft tissue shadow has actually grown as uh, the as the tibia has healed. This is because she's got a lot of ankle pain. The ankle feels unstable. She, and you can see that she's losing some joint space on the lateral side of the, the, the ankle. But there is deformity here. And by correcting that deformity, you can see by correcting that deformity, a lot of her symptoms have completely disappeared. And she, she's uh, in about two years down the line with the um, with the fractures all, with the osteotomies all uh, united and with her symptoms dramatically reduced because the alignment and the mechanics of the ankle uh, are now correct. Do we have any new answers? Do we have any other answers? I mean, we have now entered into the age of biologics. A lot of people are talking about uh, things such as platelet rich plasma and cell based therapy. So I will touch on some of the things that are available. The ones that um, I have used myself are platelet rich plasma, which is derived from the blood, bone marrow derived aspirate, and fat derived cells. Some of the evidence for this is actually um, quite lacking. Uh, there is some evidence to, to show that um, there is some improvement in pain scores, but we need more research. That seems to be the general consensus. Here is um, a paper looking at uh, bone marrow derived uh, cell therapy, and they treated 56 patients. They used bone marrow aspirate in a PRP scaffold, and they treated patients who had osteoarthritis as well as osteochondral lesions in their ankle. And they found that they provided really good pain relief, excellent result at 12 months, but it does deteriorate over a period of time. And that's generally been my experience that there is some pain relief. The pain relief um, is varied between a few months up to a couple of years. And there are a group of individuals that unfortunately don't respond to these biologic therapies. And we don't really know why that is. Hopefully future research will um, demonstrate some of the reasons for this. So in conclusion, really, the, the take home message is the following. Um, the ankle joint is, is quite sensitive to injury. Uh, injuries, particularly if they cause deformity or irregularity of the articular surface, can lead to arthritis. And injuries are the main reason for developing ankle arthritis. There are many ways that we can preserve the ankle joint. And actually preserving the ankle joint is important because by um, either replacing the ankle or fusing the ankle, there is acceleration of arthritis in the adjacent joints of the foot. And in the younger individual, you are kicking the can down the road, the problems will come back. 
So if there are ways to preserve the ankle joint, it is ideal to do it to try and help preserve all of the joints in the foot and ankle. And I think that the treatment of ankle arthritis needs to be bespoke to the individual and it needs to be bespoke to the group of problems that that particular ankle arthritis is uh, presenting. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope that uh, has been useful. If you have um, any questions, don't hesitate to contact us. Um, I shared the um, details uh, for our secretaries earlier on in the talk. Um, we're happy to answer any questions uh, from colleagues or from patients through our private secretaries. Uh, and uh, I don't know if there's any questions. So no, no questions, all crystal clear. Anyway, thank you very much everyone for attending uh, our webinar. Thanks very much.